Hey everyone, welcome to 12 Rounder Radio. This is Jay Calder with 12rounder.com and uh, let's get right into it. Bringing you 12 Rounder Radio here. Quick results. Over the weekend, Gennady Golovkin successfully defended his version of the middleweight title against the usually durable Marco Antonio Rubio. Uh, really wasn't all that much of a fight, really. It was a bit of a weird ending, but all in all, it was just another successful knockout victory for Golovkin, who's Really been picking up quite a few of those as of late, of course. On the same card in the code feature bout of the evening, Nicholas Walter scored the biggest win of his career, a knockout, a technical knockout, but a knockout nonetheless over the previously never having been stopped. No need of Donaire. Donaire picks up only his third loss of his professional career and has suggested he'll be moving down to junior featherweight. And it is with that in mind that we get to the first discussion, if you will, for the show this week, and that is the future of No Nito Donaire. Uh, if you want to hear about the prospects of Walters and his potential future, potential showdown, of course, with Vasil Lomachenko, well, you probably won't hear it, but you can read it, and you can hear your own voice reading it, huh? Read it out loud. Check out Pot Shots in the description below, and you can check all that out. But here we're going to be talking about Donaire and his future. Now, in my opinion, there's about two to three ways this can go. Obviously, he can retire. Doesn't seem like it's going to happen. He's even said as much. He's not going to be retiring. So, effectively, that isn't one of the options per se, but it is technically still on the table, of course. But the other two ways that seem a little more likely is that he could simply avoid Walters. Walters is a very seemingly dynamic fighter. He has great fundamentals, a very nice jab, and, of course, he has tremendous power, particularly in that right hand. And if he's able to sort of circumnavigate that guy. He he obviously still has potential options there, perhaps fights with Gary Russell down the line, fighters like Johnny Gonzalez or even uh, Vasil Lomachenko himself. Those are fights that perhaps are a bit more winnable. Those guys might not be as devastating a puncher, with maybe the exception of uh, Gonzalez, at the weight, and he might have some success. And that's a, presumably a possibility, of course. However, the more likely scenario, the scenario that he mentioned after the fight, that he's mentioned since the fight, and the, and the scenario that I think probably best suits him in his future, would be a move back down to junior featherweight. Now, featherweight's going to be healthy. It's got Walters, it's got Lomachenko. Russell is still a talented fighter, despite the fact that he lost to a very talented fighter in, in his own right, in Vasil Lomachenko. And you still have Johnny Gonzalez, and there's always the possibility that perhaps chasing bigger names that might feel they have an advantage, so they might be willing to face him. A guy like junior featherweight champion of the world, Guillermo Rigondeaux, might be moving up to 126 pounds, and that division will be quite healthy. But what it'll also do is open up a lot of doors for the 122-pounders. They'll finally get to stop ducking the guy that everyone knows everyone in the division is ducking in Rigondeaux. You also have Mares, who has been, at least to an extent, flirting with the notion of moving down, and that's still a fight that I think plenty of people would want to see, Donaire versus Mares. Both would be coming off of recent stoppages, to a certain extent, depending on how it was built. They still have that built-in history of being sort of competitive with one another and sort of coming up to an extent at around the same time. They still have sizable followings, and on the West Coast, StubHub Center, even the Staples Center, probably with the right undercard could do very good business. It's still a very decent fight, and it's still a fight that I think in this case, if Top Rank and Golden Boy are to continue to work together, it's a fight where both feel they have enough of a chance of winning that they might be interested in doing that sort of business. It doesn't feel as though it doesn't feel as though one is risking so much more than the other. It seems like a fair enough risk for both sides. So it's possible that that sort of fight could happen. Donaire, of course, also with his size and his still, he still has some decent speed and obviously has some decent power in that left hook. He's always had it and probably will die with it. There's a, you know, there's there's a chance that he could perhaps recapture some of that older glory and perhaps even do quite well against opponents that might be a bit smaller than him. And to be truthful, Donaire looked a bit soft to me always at 126 anyway. So the idea that he would be somehow sort of cheating the system, if you will, kind of goes out of, out of, it's out of the question when you think about the fact that he would just be in probably better shape and just give himself an even advantage, not facing guys where they might be a bit more suited for the division. He'll be, at the very least, just as suited for 122 as, say, Quig or Frampton or anyone else, if not maybe a little bit more, again, based upon the fact that he does have, if he moves to 122, probably the best punch in the division, with maybe the exception of Frampton. But again, the best fighter that's ever had to taste that punch is Kiko Martinez, who is a good, sturdy fighter, but is certainly not necessarily a world beater. 
That all having been said, there are plenty of options, as I said, for Donaire. With Rigondia moving up, that sort of eliminates possibly losing again if he reaches the top of the division. There's still the Mara's fight. There could be fights with Frampton. There could be fights with Quig. All of those sort of fights could definitely take place if they take place, you know, in in a, in a certain period of time, because those other fighters like Quig and Frampton will eventually have to move up. But nonetheless, fights like that could be made. The reason I think it's such a good move, however, is not just because of there, are, there are plenty of options. There are plenty of options if you're willing to take any sort of risks. You can move all the way up to, you know, lightweight and junior welterweight, if that's what you desire to do, and you could take some risks, and you could definitely have some big fights, and you could also get your head punched off in a single round. I'm talking about risks that actually make sense, and why I think this move makes sense for Donaire is quite obvious. You can look at his most recent string of opponents. You can look at guys like Wilfredo uh, Vasquez Jr., you can look at um, Jeffrey Matabula. You can look at plenty of his most recent opponents. And if you notice one thing, with the exception of a quite faded Jorge Arce and a fairly faded Vic Darchinian, a fighter, by the way, that Donaire had to actually come back against in, in Darchinian. He was not winning that fight. At the very least, it was even, and that stoppage late in that fight probably ensured he was going to win, if, if not made sure that he was going to win because he was not in any way, shape, or form way ahead on points in that fight. If you really, if you exclude those two guys that to an extent were undersized as well and were certainly over the hill, especially Arce, if you, and way undersized was Arce, if you, if you exclude those two names, the last stoppage that Donaire picked up was actually in 2011 against Fernando Montiel, at bantamweight. The guy did not necessarily carry his power at, up with him as much as it might have been perceived. Yes, he broke the job, Matabuli. Yes, he... Excuse me. Yes, he... He he was able to stop a faded Arce and a faded Darchinian. But he had to come back late to stop Darchinian. And Arce might be the most faded name that Donair has taken on perhaps in his whole career, and that's not even an overstatement. That literally is perhaps the worst fighter he's faced in terms of how, whether or not this fighter was, is, was, is in his prime while Donaire was, in theory, in his prime. It's not a great win for all intents and purposes. The last stoppage he got was three years ago against Montiel, and it was at bantamweight, and it was a fair fight. Both were fairly, uh, you know, sized and what have you. It was just Donaire was, you know, probably always going to win that fight anyway. And I predicted he'd win that fight. I think most people predicted he'd win that fight. He was the favorite, and he did. Okay, great. He did what he was supposed to do. That's the last, in my personal opinion, legitimate stoppage of Donaire's career. Again, the other two sort of seemed like, with Darchini, it seemed like he should have been able to do it earlier. And with Arce, it didn't seem like that fight, let alone that knockout, needed to happen. We all knew who was going to win. So it just seems like the move down, obviously not to Bantamweight, that's effectively out of the question. He's not making 118 unless he gets deathly ill, and I don't think we should be wishing that upon him, obviously. But the move down just seems to make sense. It just seems like he'll maybe regain some of his, his power. The speed might not appear as great as it does now, because fighters like Walters are bigger. So naturally they're going to look a bit slower, and Walters is not the biggest, or the quickest puncher in the world anyway. But the... It's a fair trade to trade maybe that speed advantage you have if you're still going to be very fast to begin with and you're also going to have that power. And while Donair, yes, was stopped against Walters, he can take a sizable punch. I mean, that right hand that hit him right on the temple, right on the top, snapped his head back, falls face first. Most guys do not get up from that. And Donair got up from that. And Donair himself mentioned that he was out of it and was probably going to be severely hurt in that fight if it wasn't stopped when it was stopped. But he was up and ready to get stopped even more severely if he needed to be. He has definitely the ability to take a punch. Remember, that was the first time he's, at least on record, been knocked down in a professional fight. So it, this is not a situation where... He's running away from the punch, if you will, where he's he's afraid of being hit. He was hit with Rigondeau's best shots, and other than in the 12th round when he seemed to occur some damage on his eye, he it didn't appear as though he was really all that affected by Rigondeau's punches to the point where he was perhaps on the verge of being knocked out or stopped. He, you know, he felt them, that's why he didn't just rush in, you know, clumsily, but at the same time, he was able to, at the very least, cope with the power. It was the skill and the movement and everything else that seemed to be a bit of a problem and would be a bit of a problem for virtually everyone else. That having been said, he's not running away from the punch. He's just giving himself 
a puncher's advantage again. And in my opinion, doing it in a fair way. Again, it doesn't feel like he's cheating the system. It just feels like he's not cheating himself anymore either. It's a great thing, and it's a very noble thing to try and chase bigger and better things, in this case physically and literally. And it's a great thing to try and rack up as many championships and as many wins as you continue to move up. That's all well and good. And certain fighters can do it, and others can't. And I believe at this point, while Denner was able to do it for a point in time, he's probably reached his ceiling in the sense that this will probably 122, 126, that range is probably probably where he's met his match in terms of being able to do things both physically and then also having, you know, the star power to get these sort of things done. This is probably where he crests. And that's not a bad thing, because again, while 126 is going to be plenty healthy, so is 122, especially if it's worked properly. And I think Donaire has enough left that at the very least he can make some of these fights interesting, and I'll certainly be watching them. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the move. Who would you like to see him face? Frampton, Quig, all that sort of stuff. Please be sure to leave it in the comments below and leave it on Twitter at 12 Rounder Boxing. And of course, subscribe. Love the subscriptions, love the feedback, the comments. Share the video and of course, like it. All that stuff is great. It makes me feel good. It feeds my ego. And I need that. And it's a wonderful feeling. So please, please make a loser like myself feel awesome. In any event, Click over, of, sure, of course, to part two. We're going to be talking about some of the British names that are making some moves, potentially on the verge of having some even bigger fights, that have some fights coming up, and some of the ramifications of those fights, so on and so forth. And I'll also be giving you a little bit of a sneak peek on the schedule. It's, uh, well, the fights I'll be mentioning are pretty much damn near the schedule. But in any event, be sure to click over for that. And, uh, yeah, so talk to you then.